Thank you. I'm short, so I'm going to try and do this. So um, I will start, I think, from, I'll pick up on a point that Harry um, raised towards the end, thinking about subjects that are sometimes considered unresearchable, not worthy of research. And this idea of interdisciplinary research, whereas I was sort of myself as just undisciplined. Um, and when uh, Shose sent me this um, invitation, she said, well, how does your work in the area of black studies, um, African studies, and African feminism contribute? And I'll enter this, con um, this conversation by looking at the way in which not only myself, but some literary and cultural scholars, give me time, yeah, such as, uh, such as myself, Dina Rigaga, Grace Musila, formerly at Stellenbosch, now at Witz, Linda Spencer at Rhodes, Danai Mopuza at um, Witz, um, are working with popular culture. Uh, such as social media, chick lit, romantic comedy, music, areas that have not been considered sites of serious scholarship, in other words. Um, and how we locate our work in conversation with black feminist scholars, um, often Afro-diasporic scholars of popular culture, such as Bell Hooks, Nicole Fleetwood, Gwendolyn uh, Poe, as well as African feminists, such as Pumla Kola, Zin Magubani, etc. Um, who inter and how this work interrogates um, colonial constructions of black womanhood and the pathologies uh, and somehow this idea of black femininity being associated with a sort of pathological hypersexuality. Um, I was inspired by Dina Gaga's 2014 article, Mapping um, Emerging Constructions of Good Time Girls in Kenyan Popular Culture and examining this figure of the good time girl, young, educated, up for a party, yeah? but willing to use her body um, to get money. I think South Africa has its own good time girls in the media. Um, we see the way in which figures such as Kanyum Bao get um, represented, right? Um, and how, and you know, she, she made a very interesting analysis of a Kenyan Facebook group called Campus Divas for the Rich. Yeah, which inspired um, actually the title of uh, my current title, which is Divas and Deviants, right? Um, and my own work, um, although grounded here, um, I come from French and Francophone studies, so I've done comparative literature. And my work has always been around building bridges. Building bridges not only um, through between Anglophone, Francophone, Africa, African studies and Afro, African diaspora studies. Um, and so I look at, um, I have a forthcoming article which I'm going to use as the basis for this, which is Deviance and Divas, Hip Hop Feminism and Black Visuality um, in Laura Ecoué's Icon Urbaine. So who is Laura Ecoué? French Togolese author, um, who takes on Francophone hip hop feminism um, and uses it to explore her own experiences of being a black woman in Paris. And I draw this together with Nicole Fleetwood on racial icons, blackness and the public, and to reflect on how the globalized circulation uh, of representations of black femininity as pathologically sexualized or excessive um, can be read through um, hip hop culture. And I think hip hop culture, we can agree, has come to inflect um, many ways in which we read popular cultures, um, even in our own um, space in South Africa. Um, so I'm not going to expand on this today, but um, this work sort of continues my engagement with um, the way in which the construction of black womanhood as grotesque, grotesquely in um, brackets, hypersexualized, has been portrayed in French francophone literary and cultural forms. Uh, notably, a previous article where I was um, where I looked at a, a Swiss Gabonese author who um, writes her own autobiographical account of being a black woman in Paris, but dedicates it to Sarah Bartman and doubles herself, calls herself Zara as opposed to Sarah, and plays 
um, with that representational doubling um, in thinking through her own body and how it is read and how it is understood. Um, and, um, and that particular work then um, really draws a lot from Pumla Gola and Zin Mangubane. Um, but what I do conclude in that paper is with the observation that the representational doubling is something in a sense that we all live with, if we're black women. Um, and that is particularly relevant to the study of discourses of popular media um, that commodify, and I can never pronounce this word, teopeia, uh, um, then large buttocks as sexualized in hip hop parlance booty. Right? Noting that some notions of celebrity play on the Hottentot Venus prototype um, as a sexualizing or excessively sexualized gaze, um, attracting it in certain instances. Um, look at the way that Kim Kardashian plays with um, booty, blackness, um, and hypersexuality. And what Nicole says is that growing up as a um, Fleetwood starts with in her in race, on racial icons is her own lived experience as a black woman. And noting that as a black girl, that image was mediated by public images of blackness. Um, and um, Flutu works the observation of the tension between the veneration of iconic or the godlike image um, of the diva and the denigration of, of blackness at the same time. And when I say iconic, I look at the way in which um, black popular cultures have assumed a certain status, uh, are consumed in certain ways, are appropriated in certain ways, and yet live alongside the denigration of blackness. So I read um, hip hop as a popular culture that navigates both the pathos of ghetto, ghetto or cheap blackness with the veneration of black musical celebrity. Um, now, hip hop culture is an is object of obvious critique due to its representation of some, a figure that I'd call the video girl, um, the women who dance in the music video, often crit critique for being misogynistic representations. Um, you know, so it straddles a very thin line between the validation of blackness and the objectification of black women's bodies. And there's a way, however, there are ways in which um, the video girl and the hip hop female, female artist, artists also have to make choices to objectify themselves for commercial purposes. And this I read through the notion of celebrity. Um, the celebrity icon's image is devoured and regurgitated. She's the object of fantasy. She exists in, in hyperbolic terms. She is excess. So hyperbole and excess is uh, paradoxically part of being iconized in certain ways um, and yet denigrated at the same time for being deviant, being pathological and yet in your sexuality and yet admired for being able to move your body in certain ways. Um, and these codes of femininity can be read as opposite sides of a coin when it comes to the objectification of black women in hip hop culture. And I'm not going to concern myself with whether um, the hip hop image of black femininity is emancipatory of objectifying, but rather reflect on how the consumerist material practices related to hip hop culture and other musical cultures um, can be read as remixing, recoding blackness um, and re as a signifier of um, social marginalization and of um, pathological sexuality or deviance. So I'm going to return, I'm going to take the example of the 2004-2005 Take Back the Music campaign um, promoted by Essence magazine, a leading African-American women's magazine, um, which was contesting the misogyny of bitches and whores. Um, lyrics and the objectification of black women in music videos. Now while Take Back the Music um, highlighted the tension between the pro-sex public image of hip-hop culture and the idea of black responsibility. Um, it was promoted uh, by Essence as uh, creating a safe space um, for, for women. Um, and yet at the same time, in that creation of a safe space, there's a way in which it then becomes imbricated, um, imbricated in notions of respectability. 
Yeah. Are you a black woman? Are you a queen? Or are you the bitches and hoes? Right? Um, and a certain sort of policing um, about what women's sexualities are allowed to be and how they're allowed to be expressed. Right? So once again, it falls into the trap of excess. Right? Um, so, um, sorry, lost. So likewise, hip hop feminists argue that the image of blackness needs to be read, does need to be read against the historical construction of um, hypersexual or, um, or excessive. Um, in their critique of um, misogynistic bitches and hoes, um, they really look at the emergence of the video girl, um, and I'll call her the video girl for want of a better word. You know, the woman, I, I don't know what to call it. I mean, I've had my own nine-year-old trying to show me that she's twerking. So I, <laughs> you know, this is what she's learning as a way of negotiating her body, right? As um, a young black woman or girl. Um, so if the video girl symbolizes a type of ghetto or cheap blackness associated with selling one's body for material gain, black women's musical celebrity is read through the figure of the diva. And uh, Fleetwood explores divahood through an analysis of Diana Ross's desirability as a racial icon, noting that this was achieved through careful cur curation by Motown. Um, this image, in order to achieve mainstream acceptability, that refuted notions of black excess, um, it had to be a controlled sexuality, right? Um, whereas the video girl obviously rises to, prom to prominence by projecting twerking, <laughs> Get ghetto blackness, uncontrolled, deviant hypersexuality. Um, and so um, the line between the Although the line between the veneration of the former and the denigration of the latter can be very thin indeed, the singularity of divahood um, does contrast to the anonymity. Um, and while, as um, Bell Hooks says, rap and hip hop culture has enabled an underclass of black youth to develop a critical voice, um, rendering, yeah. Rendering, invisible, rendering visible the historical silencing of um, a racial underclass, this dichotomy of, of divahood and deviance problematizes um, this um, hip hop as a form that mediates <coughs> black women's visuality. So I'm interested in how hip hop in how hip hop culture engages with the public image of femininity or the idea that as black women, we construct ourselves as social beings through the mediation of images. Um, on, one can associate um, the patho pathological narcissism um, of divahood um, with this idea, um, with racial iconicity and hyperbolic consumption. Um, and I therefore um, use hip hop feminist theory to unpack uh, the consumptual practices of hip hop culture, the notions of bling, right, which are also associated with um, the video girl. So um, my next chap um, section, I'll call it narcissistic me. Yes, we do perform divahood in certain ways at certain times strategically. Okay, and it's a way of dealing with the curious inv invisibility and hypervisibility um, of black femininity. Um, and I'll return to um, Fleetwood, and she makes a very interesting observation that um, celebrity or iconicity requires labor to make it look effortless, right? Um, you know, it, it does require labor to acquire that sort of um, narcissistic gaze upon oneself, um, or to at least perform it. Um, and uh, I look at feminist scholar Anne Gary, who says she does not states that she does not cons consider narcissism as a form of self-love that is necessarily sexual, but argues that the narcissistic woman might find sexual pleasure in her own body. That even the notion of, even though the notion of sexy is mediated by societal terms, um, for the narcissist, um, it can be, they can be the subject as well as the object, right? Um, so that this suggests that some women who revel in performing heteronormative sexiness may be doing it for themselves and rather for anybody else, right? <laughs> rather than to attract a male or any other gaze. Um, 
Um, and as hip hop feminist uh, Brittany Cooper then relating it, this idea to hip hop feminism says, says the female spectator does not just consume the image created by the male gaze, um, but may be consumed by it. Um, so what I, so diva hood implies certain things for me and applies the hyperbolic consumption of and by the racial icon. Um, and in this way, um, the notion of bling, right, um, and how you may use your body to acquire the material um, becomes important. So what is bling? Um, Gwendolyn Powell um, asks a question. What does it mean that hip hop has the capability to make a woman a pseudo superstar? And how does this further complicate our understanding of how black women responds to things like the ideal beauty image. Um, this I linked to the idea of black um, femininity as, or blackness as lack, material and otherwise, and how hip hop transforms lack into substance. Um, so what is bling? Bling, the urban dictionary. Okay, definition number one. Created by Wheezy F, Baby, or Lil Wayne. <laughs> huh? Resembling the image or sound of a sparkling diamond, right? Bling, image. Um, definition number two, the song Bling. Um, can be found on the album Chopper City in the Ghetto. Um, 1999, featuring Cash Money members, including Lil Wayne, who sing the chorus bling, and since then, um, the phrase has been popular, popularized through hip hop culture. So the epitome of transforming blackness as lack into blackness as substance is bling. And I relate this to pseudo celebrity and back to the idea of Dina Digaga and the good time girl um, as a sort of form of pseudo celebrity. Um, and um, what's interesting here is that Tricia Rose um, sort of refutes ideas where we say hip hop culture through being globalized has become more immersed in commodification. She says commodification has always been actually a part of hip hop culture. Um, although the nature of that relation has shifted over time. So hip hop cr culture creates a referential universe in which whiteness is associated with ignorance, being an outsider, and blackness with insider knowledge, um, the insider knowledge to decode the cultural form. Um, you know, if you don't know Lil Wayne, if you don't, then you, know, you might not know Bling, right? Um, and this hermeneutic challenge creates a space, right, uh, for a globi globally mediated form of blackness. And I'm always very careful in my work, which I probably haven't made very clear in this presentation, um, to say that I'm not conflating African, African and black, right? That there is a way in which we can think of black studies and African studies, even though they, they are in conversation with each other. Um, but 15 minutes is 15 minutes. <laughs> OK. Um, so pseudo-celebrity can be related to Fleetwood's um, association. Um, of um, black celebrity with a hyperbolic uh, appetite for consumption, which is often reenacted in um, hip hop music videos and the, through also the consumption of women as um, sexual commodities. Um, in aspiring for divahood, a black woman might perfect her music video look, but not have the buying power of real celebrity. But the video girl does remain a problematic representation of deviant or hypersexualized femininity through the trope of being out of the sexually available bitches and hoes. And one need only look at Nelly's controversial 2004 music video, Tip Drill, which provoked outrage um, from women um, from, for its portrayal of the rapper swiping his credit card between the buttocks of the video girl, um, right? Um, and yet, I'll read this as a challenge um, to problematize this staging of deviance, if you will, um, um, through um, 
Gwendolyn Powell's challenge to study hip hop pseudo celebrity as a way of complicating our understanding of how black women react to public images of black femininity. So while hip hop culture does produce racial icons such as Beyonce, and we have our own South African Beyonce's, right? Um, the singularity of these divas lives alongside the faceless circulation on consumption of the video girl as a public image that is imbricated in the representation of black women's bodies as desirable and yet deviant. The video girl may not be real, but like Nicole Fleetwood in her introduction to on racial icons, like the, um, the Kenyan good time girl, um, the globalized circulation of popular cultures such as hip hop um, culture um, force women to negotiate their visuality in relation to this and other images of pathologically hypersexual black femininity. Now, what I'm going to, my, in conclusion here, what I would like to suggest is this is that the narcissism that is associated with divahood and of looking at yourself through a sexualized gaze, um, which, like I said, we might see, um, might see people such as Kanye Bao playing with the idea of um, using your body um, for commercial gain or the critique, more like, possibly, of, of such figures, um, can be seen in essay as playing out a space of, of creating a space of psychological resistance to the idea of being a deviant. Um, where else do you go if you are constructed um, and seen as already pathologically sexualized um, than to take it to the next level and to play it out, um, play out the mask? And I will leave you um, with that thought, I may have overstepped my 15 minutes. Thank you.